Okay, seconds. Okay, so how do I know? Okay, I think we're live. Okay. Great. Hello. Uh, good evening. My name is Diana Barisha, and I'm the Executive Director of Forum for Civic Initiatives. I am delighted to have been chosen to moderate, facilitate, actually uh, discuss with this uh, great panel on philanthropy and the role of NGOs or otherwise civil society organizations. Uh, I'm here with uh, friends, actually, and uh, people with a lot of experience in philanthropy and uh, private sector or civil society organizations. Let me start by introducing the speakers of this panel. Mr. Richard Luca, experienced financial executive, private investor, philanthropist and public policy advocate, but above everything, Mr. Lukai co-founded and worked tirelessly to build the American University in Kosovo and helped computerize countless schools in villages around Southeast Europe. Hello, good evening, and welcome, Richard, to this very interesting panel. It's great to have you here. Thank you for the kind words. It's a delight yes. to be here as well. Thank you. Uh, we will be joined shortly by Mrs. Spressa Jackley, founder of United for Autism. Meanwhile, a very good friend of mine, and she's the winner of FIDES Award for Philanthropic Contributions from Diaspora in Kosovo 2015. I look forward to having her as a member of this panel because she will have to share quite a lot from her own experience working to help children with special needs, in particular, uh, establishing her foundation named United for Autism in the United States. She's also a member of the UNIFEM, United Nations Organization for Women, and also uh, she's a member of uh, HCUND, a hospitality committee for the United Nations delegation. Mark Cosma, a dear friend, chair of board of Global Albanians Foundation, He's been active in the Albanian community for over 25 years since his first trip to Albania in 1992. He's president and the founding member of the Albanian American Massachusetts Association in Boston and in the process of establishing, or I think he established the Global Albanians Foundation to promote Albanian philanthropy and diaspora and to help Albanian nonprofit organizations. He's also uh, on the Gurmeen Advisory Board and the Board of Directors of uh, Actions for Mothers uh, and Children in Kosovo. Good evening, Mark. Welcome and thank you for all your help and countless assistance to all of the CSOs in Kosovo and Albania. I haven't done it. Uh, Ms. Laura Iveze, Senior Compliance Analyst, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Good evening, Laura. Uh, I found out that you work at Blue Cross Blue Shields to provide people with the security to know that they have health care when they need it. Uh, since 2006 2017, uh, Laura is a member of the board of the Church Castriotti Foundation, a foundation which supports Albanian students in the state of Michigan. You also, uh, your organization covers over 32 children and financially supports 30 free clinics. Thank you for being uh, a member, part of this panel tonight and part of this very important discussions. Welcome. Thank you for having me, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and finally, Tauland Hoja is the executive director of Kosovo Our Civil Society Foundation, a civil society activist from Kosovo. He's also uh, the chair of board of City Coast Platform, uh, one of the largest network of CSOs in Kosovo, as well as the deputy chair of board of the Balkan Civil Society N Development Network uh, in the region, in the Balkans. Welcome, Taulan. Looking forward to the discussion and having you as a, also as a panelist in tonight's uh, panel. Thank you very much, Diana, and uh, hi to everyone. It will be a pleasure. Thank you. So, philanthropy and the role of NGOs. This is a, a, a panel session that is being organized and, and held tonight in the framework of uh, Diaspora Speaks, Diaspora FLED 2020, uh, um, part of the all the organizations uh, developed by Gurmeen organization 
uh, in Kosovo, very well established and known organization dealing with uh, diaspora relations with the origin countries. So uh, the way I structured this, this uh, panel is divided in three parts. And I would like to start by just a short intro and then uh, we go through questions. And uh, let me just start by saying that among Albanians, the willingness to donate money, time and expertise to the con countries of origin, be it Albania, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, has never been lacking. Uh, at various times, many people in diaspora have responded to calls for help at home. But over the years, the dynamics of diaspora communities has changed. In this regard, philanthropy towards countries of origin is reshaping. At a time when there are many causes and cases around the world to donate for, there is a need for trust and a strong connection to focus donations to home countries. In order to increase the latter, we need to talk not only about donations, but also the sustainability of the money given and the impact delivered. We need to talk about transparency from both sides, donors and receivers to create such partnerships that deliver impact. So many questions raised like how to demand transparency, how to implement and report the money received from donations, as well as efficiency and effectiveness of donations as a way to trust building. So many questions. And um, I would like to start with Mr. Richard Lukai. Uh, Richard, uh, the first thing that uh, actually comes to my mind is that diaspora. We all, at certain times of our lives, lived outside of our origin country, myself as well. So homeland remains an important conceptualization of diasporas. With this in mind, we come to acknowledge that diasporas go through changes, of course, redefining, renewing alliances with the origin country, redefining sectors in need for support and new forms of engagement with the homeland. So, in your understanding, in your perspective, in your experience with uh, countries in the region, I'm talking about your own origin country, Kosovo, Albania, has the dynamic of Albanian diaspora changed in the recent years? And if so, what does that imply for the interest and willingness to contribute to the origin country? Well, thank you. It's a very thoughtful question. Um, I would say more than change, the, the diaspora experience with the region has uh, expanded. Um, I, I think we still have uh, what I would call fundamental philanthropy, which is, you know, families uh, providing um, mostly financial resources to support uh, loved ones that uh, um, uh, find themselves in a shortfall for one reason or another, or needing basic health care and not really being prepared uh, for the costs of such burdens, uh, et cetera. So the, the fundamental layer of activity, I think, mm -hmm. remains very much uh, intra-region as well as uh, externally beyond uh, to diaspora outreach. Um, the, uh, the expansion opportunities are places where philanthropy can go beyond the one-to-one -one, uh, contribution um, and that is an area where we're starting to see very early innings of activity. Um, you know, you mentioned the American University in Kosovo that was uh, an, a, a pioneer style project. Um, there have been um, other projects like uh, the rebuilding of some schools uh, in the area, the rehabilitation of various programs, the launch of new uh, NGOs, as the case may be as well, uh, a number of which were mentioned uh, uh, that other folks on the panel are involved with and I've had the pleasure to be involved with as well in many cases. Um, those activities, candidly, um, you know, are relatively new uh, in, in that philanthropy is still relatively rare uh, as, a, as a phenomenon or as an understood part of civil society, uh, really throughout the Balkans, I would almost say mostly throughout all of Europe. Um, uh, you know, in the U.S., the, the, the philanthropic circles are actually much more a part of the pillars of society than they are in other parts of the world. 
um, and the, the merits or benefits of which are, are vast. And uh, uh, philanthropy affords at that institutional layer, when you think about these levels of engagements, the ability to fill in where governments fail, the ability to fill in where um, uh, governments aren't able to with resources and capabilities that aren't otherwise at their disposal. Uh, and it's also an opportunity to actually prioritize higher uh, in the national stack um, uh, uh, activities and or engagements or other civic minded activities than the government perhaps would ever prioritize. Mm -hmm. So that level of relationship between the diaspora and the region is still in its formative stage. And candidly, we really haven't yet reached uh, the third category, which is what I would call the institutionalization of giving. And uh, that level of activity almost looks like commercial activity because it can involve the establishment of sovereign funds. You could, you could see the establishment of, uh, like I was involved early on in my career in the first Hungary Development Fund, which uh, allowed for um, uh, diaspora members of Hungary to actually have an investment vehicle to not just give back to Hungary, but to give back in the form of providing capital for growth and employment and multiplier effect in the economy beyond what philanthropy can otherwise do in a giving format. So um, I think there's there's great potential. I, I listened with interest to a number of the uh, uh, panels over the last number of days talking about the role of remittances and the role of varying forms of uh, uh, engagement financially between uh, uh, civic society and commercial society and society overall um, in uh, in the Balkans and their respective diasporas, which uh, uh, continue to actually be meaningful purveyors of capital back to the region. Um, and uh, I look forward to the rest of the discussion about uh, how that partnership has been working and how we could do it better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very, very interesting about the foundations of philanthropy uh, that you highlighted and the family support. Indeed, it's true that this country somehow, mm, I wouldn't like to say su survives because of diaspora, but the remittances and uh, contributions from diaspora are key to the uh, existence of the economy in Kosovo, alongside uh, foreign investments as well, but uh, quite, quite important. Individual donations and diaspora donations for Kosovo are vital, vital contributions. Uh, in terms of like uh, education and schools and infrastructure, it kind of brings me back the contribution of our main philanthropic uh, icon of the Albanians, which is, uh, in my understanding and my belief, it's Hassan Pushtina, which he actually used all his private uh, financial means, everything to the education, but in also in political terms to the, the, the cause of Albanians. But very interesting that for a man of the 19th century to think of the education of young girls from very uh, poor families it was uh, very important at that time. It kind of uh, gives me the hope that yes, uh, in spite of people uh, considering philanthropy as a new notion for the country and the region itself, it still uh, makes me think that, well, if Hassan Pristina knew the importance of education and, and he gave everything <laughs> to the education of young girls, then we still have hopes and we did know something about philanthropy even uh, during those times. To you, Mark, share uh, some some same thoughts as uh, uh, Richard with regard to the dynamics of Albanian diaspora and any potential shifts happening uh, nowadays within the the understanding and the willingness, the interest of di Albanian diaspora yeah, okay. to contribute. So, first thing I like to say is that. Um, People should realize that from the country of Albania, there was no diaspora for 40 years. So this has been a major change sure. over the last 30 years. You can think of it like a 30-year-old person. You know, when you're 30, in a lot of ways, you're just starting out in life. So I think um, sometimes when people talk about our diaspora, they have to take into account that it's coming from many different countries over different periods of time. And so, for example, at least in the U.S., I would say that the 
uh, diaspora that originated from Kosovo or from mm. Montenegro has been much more active and much more organized than yeah. that from Albania. But this will start to change. Uh, mm. The second biggest and most important change, especially as it relates to diaspora philanthropy, is the demographic change. You know, yeah. 30 years ago, people came because they needed jobs. They were trying to survive uh, getting by. Now their children are young professionals working in New York, Boston, San Francisco, mm. Washington, Berlin, London, Rome. They have very uh, high qualified professional jobs. They have good incomes and they have a connection to Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro, and they do want to donate. So I think we're poised. We have this economic and financial potential that we never had in the past. Uh, and now, you know, institutions and technology make it possible for us to um, tap into this philanthropy. <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons we founded uh, Global Albanians Foundation in the United States, is to be a vehicle for vehicle diaspora philanthropy. We raised about $220,000 for the earthquake uh, assistance over the last year, and then another 60 or 70,000 for COVID relief. <clears throat> so there's clearly a willingness to give. And as Rich very uh, aptly pointed out, one of the key missing ingredients is institutions. You need institutions to attract bigger philanthropy. It's fine to help your family. It's fine to help your cousins. Yeah. Uh, but that has to change through institutional giving. And also reality is that, uh, you know, I sometimes joke, grandma is dead. You know, 30 years ago, people were sending money home to Albania and Kosovo to help the grandparents. And now they've been in the diaspora longer. The family, you know, Albania Kosovo doesn't need as much help. <clears throat> so we need to institutionalize this uh, philanthropic support. And as some of you pointed out, it's also very important to do this because the amount of money that comes from international donors like the EU or Switzerland, Italy, Germany, uh, bilateral assistance to the United States, this money is going to decline in the future. So that's going to leave a hole that needs to be filled to finance civil society and philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Uh, in our homeland countries. So this needs to be done not only by diaspora, but also by uh, companies with a high sense of corporate social responsibility in the homeland yeah. country. So working together, there's a lot of potential to tap into the philanthropy, but we need to create the institutions to do it. Uh, very, very interesting. And I, I so support your, your uh, statement, let's say. Uh, it's true that Albanian diaspora, in, especially in North America, for example, it's very diverse. I mean, historically, Albanians from Albania, the first Albanians that moved to the United States uh, were like from Korcha. And I think Yumar come from families that were yeah. among the first Albanians to, to migrate. So it's, um, I fully share the, the, the opinion that Albanian diaspora is so diverse. Some uh, Albanians from Albania are very sort of oriented towards education when they leave their country. Uh, Kosovars are a lot more somehow interested in, in politics and and uh, the same with uh, Albanians from Montenegro and North Macedonia, uh, Albanians from North Macedonia, a lot more entrepreneurial and also politics. But at the end of the day, one thing is common for all of them that they they all share the feeling that they need to contribute at individual level within their home or within their origin country, which is fine. But I also agree that we need institutions to kind of structure this, uh, this contribution by diaspora because it's huge contribution, be it financial means or expertise, know-how, skills, everything. It needs to be a lot more structured than just individual uh, givings and donations because it's fine like rich said uh, individual donations but that needs to be uh, uh, somehow elevated and become more structured so then its impact in in the origin countries it's more strategic and more towards where we would like to see our countries be at least more developed and and a lot more developed actually and far away from corruption so uh, thank you. And uh, Laura, uh, I'd like to, to hear your, your thoughts on this uh, level of discussion. Uh, what are your thoughts on the importance of diaspora and, and, and changes or diversity? Or how do you feel about what we're talking? I 
think everyone has made some really good points, especially when it yeah. comes uh, to foundations of philanthropy and, you know, how to, you know, make sure that, you know, when money is in uh, going to the homeland, it's staying in the homeland. Laura, I can't hear you. And it's being ex um... I can hear her. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. okay. Maybe it's just me. I apologize. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Can you guys, is, am I good now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so now the new wave, um, and I think Mark and Rick, I think they both touched on it. So, uh, the new wave of professionals um, coming out, I think this is going to be huge um, to you know get into that next step, step of philanthropy, philanthropy back in the homeland. Uh, I see it, you know, in the organization uh, that I'm in with the George Castagnotti Scholarship Fund, and you know we see a lot of young uh, donors who uh, we haven't seen them, you know, donate before. You know, maybe their parents were donating. Uh, and, you know, sending money back home in the 90s, or they were, you know, sending money uh, for Albanian causes in D.C., um, you know, when the Albanian lobbyists uh, were strong during that time. So now we're seeing, you know, the children of those people um, stepping in and filling the roles here. Um, and now, the, you know, I understand the key is to get, you know, the money back home. Uh, we see it now, a lot of donations coming in. Uh, you know, what we do is we give... Uh, and Michigan scholarships. And we try to focus on students that have F1 visas. So actually, um, this year we have our first uh, student from Skindedai. Uh, she's an F1 student. Um, she plays volleyball, a student athlete. And we were able to help her, uh, you know, cover what the uh, athletic and academic portion of the scholarship didn't. And so uh, these new donors that, that are bringing in money, um, I think that this would be a great opportunity for them you know, they've expressed, uh, you know, are we bringing international students here? How are we connecting, you know, uh, with the homelands? Um, and so I think that there is, the diaspora is changing, but I think for a way uh, that that can be much more organized going forward in the philanthropic roles, especially, you know, when you're, uh, you know, discussing, uh, connecting, you know, private to public sectors. Um, with this new wave of the diaspora, the new uh, wave, you know, a lot of education, and people with uh, strong incomes that have the ability and also, um, you know, being just, you know, continue to develop. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I agree with it, everything um, that you three mm -hmm. did. Just the point of, I think- I can hear like nothing, I'm not there. Diaspora. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Thank, thank you, Laura. Hi. Hello? Thank you, thank you, yes. Uh, uh, interesting, yeah. Also, uh, I also think it's interesting because it's what second, third generation of Albanian diaspora that continues to grow this this uh, uh, desire to contribute to the origin country, be it with scholarship or or contribution to families or health uh, contribution, anything. So, it, what's important is that. The spirit is still there, although second, third generation of, of Albanians have been born and raised in, in uh, North America in this case. And, you know, families, Albanian families are more and more uh, interested in, in sending their children to school, to education. So one would ask, like, why do I have to send home, uh, to send money home if I have so many things to do in my own, uh, in my, uh, for my own family? in let's say in united states for example so it's interesting it's really interesting to capture this this spirit this uh, very good will and interest of albanian diaspora to continue its contribution towards origin country thank you and now let me get the the perspective the thoughts of somebody from pristina from kosovo uh, about everything that has been discussed so far for diaspora and how do you uh, talent how do you see uh, diaspora Albanian diaspora being involved in Kosovo but not only Kosovo generally speaking in all Albanian speaking uh, spaces in the region what are your thoughts on, on the discussion mm -hmm. uh, thank you Dan and thank you to uh, Richard and Mark and Laura for bringing up very interesting issues which I think uh, uh, are uh, define the moment that we are in between uh, diaspora and uh, let me talk about Kosovo but most of the things that I I will talk about Kosovo I think uh, apply also for, for Albania for Macedonia and the entire uh, uh, homeland of where Albanians come from 
the readiness of diaspora to contribute to, for the homeland uh, was crucial to our survival for many generations, I think. Uh, and uh, this has uh, produced a mentality of, in a way, unconditional uh, support uh, and uh, a perception that diaspora is obliged to, uh, to contribute and to support to the homeland. Uh, I think now we are in a, in a moment of history that we need to, to move beyond this, uh, this mentality. And I'm talking now more uh, from the side of uh, Albanians, but uh, this includes, uh, I think, also the Albanians living uh, in the Balkans, but uh, this includes also the, the diaspora. This mentality of unconditional and obligatory support from diaspora to, uh, to the homeland has a serious problem, which is... Uh, removing uh, or reducing the identity of Albanians in diaspora into only one layer of identity, only the national identity. As uh, previously uh, you were uh, also mentioning, uh, Albanians, may, may, this may have been true at, to some extent for the first generations, but uh, nowadays Albanians throughout the world are global citizens, uh, like their first identity is not necessarily the national identity. As uh, for many Albanians living also in Kosovo, in Albania, and uh, uh, and throughout the world, so uh, this global citizen identity has an, a number of layers of identity, and uh, I think uh, those parts of this the identity related to different social causes and interests that we care about are the most important that we need to uh, to explore. So uh, it is perfectly fine for an Albanian living in U.S. or in Germany to donate for an organization in, I don't know, in Florida or in Stuttgart or wherever, uh, because there are needs throughout the world. What we need to make sure is that uh, the national, uh, these universal values and uh, identities uh, should not be, uh, should not exclu exclude the national identity. In contrary, we have to make sure that they become complementary. And for this, and I think we'll have the chance to talk also later on, but we need to remove uh, some prejudices that we have from both sides. Uh, Richard was uh, elaborating very good on this traditional support to the family uh, and to some extent to, let's say, humanitarian aid, housing, emergency, health, uh, and food and similar. We need to make sure that when diaspora uh, members uh, deal with, with the homeland, when they visit us, when they deal with us in any way, they do not Put, uh, put on hold this global citizen identity. Because many times uh, we see this, that when dealing with us, uh, with, with, with Albanians here, uh, we still go back to that, uh, let's say, very basic and traditional way of cooperation of, do you need like financial support for survival rather than, uh, rather than development? And this has produced also a big uh, prejudice also from our side. Uh, there are uh, there is a widespread thinking that diaspora does not really care for these civic causes that many uh, Albanians in, in the Balkans work and care about. I know this is totally not true uh, because, as I was saying, and as you were all mentioning, uh, members of diaspora are global citizens with different interests, with diverse causes they care about. Uh, and the important thing is that Kosovo, Albania, Macedonia has so many civic groups organizations, initiatives that work on such a wide area of topics and causes. So there are great chances that an Albanian from diaspora can find its cause in the homeland. Uh, although uh, it's not uh, fully related to the traditional uh, way of supporting, uh, uh, supporting the homeland. Uh, the second thing is that these groups need have a great need for support because as Mark was saying, uh, we are still mostly supported by international community. We lack domestic support. The activists in Kosovo, in Albania, and throughout the Balkans lack uh, support from citizens, from private uh, companies, from, from the government. So we are dependent on international funding and we need to, to switch this. Uh, and the last thing is that uh, in Kosovo, in Albania, in Macedonia, in Montenegro, there are great organizations that have very advanced processes and to manage funds uh, in a way that ensure independence, transparency, integrity. Uh, I can talk later on about KCSF, but we are not the only ones. There are definitely there are a number of organizations that have uh, very advanced practices that can ensure this mechanism, uh, as Richard was saying, to upgrade it into an institutional level. So to match all of these 
uh, interest from both sides and make it easily accessible uh, to all sides to ensure that the causes uh, that are supported are real causes. The people behind that causes are people with integrity. Uh, and uh, the funds that are donated or the support that is provided, even uh, if it's non-financial, non uh, is going to the, to the right dedication. It's not being uh, misused. And I'm, uh, I think later on uh, I can elaborate more on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the part that I find interesting is the unconditional support that you mentioned. Uh, from diaspora to the origin country, and that is absolutely true. Uh, what also mm, uh, captured from your elaboration is the fact that diaspora continued for many, many years to support, especially uh, uh, the, the emergency criteria has been always part of the support of the diaspora. Well, humanitarian survival humanitarian, more because rather than development. Exactly, because we as countries of origin have always, for so many years, we, and we continue to be in this emergency humanitarian need status because of so many uh, problems that have happened in Albania, Kosovo, basically have not been, uh, governments have not been able to take countries to the next stage, to the next level, whereas the diaspora that could be contributing in a parallel way moving on from a humanitarian aid kind of contribution towards more of a uh, giving that contribution a more development aspects for the countries of origin so uh let's just not uh, kind of like blame the diaspora for uh somehow <laughs> organizing their their contribution uh in a way of humanitarian or aid towards kosovo oh. or albania it's I was totally our, saying the the, no, no, the opposite just, of right. making sure that we we get this momentum yeah. and switches to the development uh, support. Right. No. No. I'm just trying to to say or to kind of uh, explain that for why this this uh, contribution for di from diaspora for many years has been somehow uh, structured towards uh, consumption, basically families help each other because that's the primary we need to to get money funds for daily consumptions so still the development aspects of contribution from diaspora has not been structured because also mark said because of a lack of uh, sort of like lack of trust among institutions here in kosovo and albania which is the major the major contributors towards not having a development aspects of uh, contributions from diaspora. Yeah, However, I, sure, uh, please. So, you know, I, I think you get to a, a big point there where people are very willing to give to their families, but mm. there's a sense of <laughs> and transparency. Uh, they give when, you know, when a child needs an operation, yeah, yeah. straight from the heart. Uh, but like you said, Albanians don't have a strong trust of institutions. Yeah. And this is going to take a few things. It, it means that NGOs have to do audits. They have to do annual reports. They have donors like to see things written. I mean, yeah, it's nice to see nice pictures, <clears throat> nice projects. Uh, that gives the uh, sort of kind of feel to the heart. Um, but if you can have serious institutions, then the Albanian institutions yeah. have to have a uh, good reporting requirement. So, to give you an example, for the earthquake projects that Global Albanians Foundation did, we probably got about 50 proposals this last year, of which I would say. At most half were good enough to be seriously considered. You know, I guess I would add a couple of things here uh, as well, because I think we sometimes get lulled into a comfort zone with the thing that we're most familiar with. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, there is uh, plenty of lessons to go around with regard to international donors that you know, some of whom would never come back and do work in the region. Uh, some of whom would tell you, you know, they donated medicines for causes and only found out that those medicines were being sold, um, not donated. Uh, the, the number of stories um, that have taken place over the course of the last 20, 30 years would boggle the mind. Um, and I think in a piece of that, you could you could almost forgive and say, okay, you know, desperate people, desperate times, do desperate things. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
people need to also be educated to appreciate that that didn't cost them just what they what they were involved in there, but cost them 10 plus years of those organizations and their continuing involvement. Um, we have lost, in some cases, very large um, partners that could be partners in healthcare, that could be partners in economic development in a variety of ways beyond just as donors. And those partners have been turned off forever. Uh, the other thing that's true is, is on these boards of these big uh, uh, philanthropies are masters of industry. I mean, you have uh, people who are CEOs of major corporations, people who are involved in diplomacy, uh, who are involved in all kinds of other grant making activities. Those activities also leave permanent uh, impressions with those people. So you almost see a generation shift of, of people to circle through that organization before you get a fresh look again. So the cost of corruption um, or the cost of mistakes is gigantic for the average person, uh, far more than can be appreciated maybe uh, at, at first blush. Um, even on the, uh, on the more commercial side, uh, the number of sort of investor tours uh, that uh, I would say, you know, investors who were capable of actually building new cities, um, you know, tra traversing the region only to realize that the institutional level of engagement um, was only interested in the contribution to themselves. And they were willing to give licenses uh, as appropriate, but uh, that meant that the level of protection at the institutional level for their activity was just not there. It's very fragile, very feeble. I mean, somebody else could pay a little bit more and make their lives miserable. So it just that level of engagement is not understood or appreciated at the, uh, the rank and file level. Uh, the last thing I would say is, despite all of this, there's good progress. There, there are people who are getting it. There are organizations that are growing. There are good examples of how things should be done. Uh, I think there is goodwill um, uh, evident. I mean, the recent earthquake example that Mark provided, uh, and that was just his foundation, by the way, there were millions raised across multiple foundations. And uh, uh, my only concern is that those funds um, be managed as well as uh, uh, GAF is doing and uh, that those groups actually tangibly represent not just pictures of houses they built, but picture, but financial statements and, uh, and organizational elements that uh, um, uh, prove uh, to the world that, and to every donor that the money was managed very carefully, very thoughtfully. And more importantly, as organizations actually start raising monies of that size, you know, if you have a million dollar grant, uh, if you work it smartly, you could actually turn it into a $10 million, um, you know, matching and, and, and leveraged proposition, particularly if the underlying asset is, uh, uh, is underlying real estate. So there, there, is, there is available knowledge and sophistication that can be brought to bear and by the way, even a role for a public-private partnership, because if you have, let's use the round number of the, that million dollars to give uh, for rebuilding homes, uh, it is an immediate opportunity for a conversation uh, with the government to say, look, this is an opportunity for us to work together. We could be the lowest risk profile proposition, but you could actually enable a financing solution here so that we could actually afford 10, 20 times the number of uh, homes that can be built. And by the way, there is something really wrong with giving people a free home. Um, and I know that's really hard to, uh, to reconcile with when people have lost things. But uh, in many cases, those were apartments. Those, yes, they lost and they lost things. But it's important to meet the challenge with the, the right met opportunity. And when you have the situation where uh, you're giving away a free home, you're opening up the opportunity for graft and corruption. And... Uh, a lot of these opportunities, it's all about learning how to do the right thing, uh, even if it's uh, uh, not always feeling like it's entirely from the heart, uh, because the heart sometimes leads us into most uh, misdirected ways. I could not agree more <laughs> with you, Richard. But uh, let me just say hello to Spresser. I can see hey, she uh, joined us guys. now. Hi, my, hello, my good apologies. evening, welcome, Spresa. It's so good to see you. I Thank introduced you, you early. So uh, um, if you can join us, we just we were talking about um, yeah. the diaspora and the diversity of, of diaspora and the connection of diaspora with homeland. Any shifting? Uh, 
what would be your 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 thoughts about the contribution of uh, Albanian diasporas to to countries of origin, Kosovo or, or Albania, for that matter? Uh, any new forms of engagement? My experience of us of ten years. I don't. I, I can't hear you. And from the beginning, where we are. Can everybody hear Shpresa? Uh, I don't hear her. You can hear me? I can. I can hear her, yes. I can. Can you? I can't hear her. Okay. Well, now we lost her entirely. <laughs> yeah, well. Well, we can continue. Uh, yeah, we can continue. For, so from what Richard was saying, especially with regard to talks to governments. Yeah, that's quite a, a, an interesting discussion. Uh, who are the partners of diaspora in discussions for really uh, important investments in the origin countries? Uh, but also this, this conversation leads to our next, to the second part of our panel, which mainly uh, somehow touches upon uh, principles, main principles that are accountability, transparency, participation and inclusion that for also for organizations, international or national, national ones are really crucial features to, to the work we do, uh, to, the, to the way we define and design our programs within our organizations. Nevertheless, uh, as I um, foresee the consensus around the uh, normative and instrumental values of the, these key principles has not been satisfactory enough for most of us as practitioners of philanthropy and practitioners of, of uh, civic activism and, and protection of human rights and democracy. So basically, uh, if I was to ask a question, that would be like, is there any, any good practice globally speaking or for example uh, american practices in terms of increasing transparency of results mainly generated by through philanthropy funding and that can ensure spending of uh, efficient spending of funds because that's what uh, we were somehow the the previous conversation was leading us towards this this very core and fundamental uh, uh, aspect of our discussion. So increasing the transparency, efficient spending of funds. Uh, who would like to, to start first? Mark, I think you're muted. Well, we can also, I can also yeah. invite Taolan to say something given that uh, actually they're quite a large foundation, an old foundation in Kosovo and uh, they seem to have uh, pretty uh, standard uh, procedures with regard to transparency and financial aspects. Right, Talant, would you like to, to take the floor mm, first? Okay, uh, thank you, Diana. Mm -hmm. I can start, I, I'll try to be brief, although I think uh, this is the part that I can say the most because we operate for 22 years now in Kosovo and I think we, we managed to build quite advanced systems of uh, designing, programming, uh, selecting, and uh, implementing uh, donor funds. Uh, the first thing is that I think whenever we talk about public funds, uh, we have to apply the same standards. Uh, regardless whether, whether those funds come, or whether the public is defined as a taxpayer through government funds, or through private or corporate uh, philanthropy, or through crowdfunding. So it's, uh, it's uh, funds from a larger group of people that want to donate for a public uh, benefit the cause. So these uh, the principles that Diana already mentioned of uh, accountability and transparency and inclusiveness and participation need to be there. So going back to the unconditional support, I think we we need we have to forget the easy funds from diaspora. This is the first uh, the first condition. We have to treat diaspora funds uh, same as we treat let's say USAID funds or EU European Union funds. Uh, or uh, all the, the other uh, development aid funds in terms of these principles of 
uh, accountability and transparency. What I can say for KCSF practices, uh, I can list just um, a few elements which I think uh, might be applied uh, also to, to the institutional uh, level that uh, we were discussing uh, before. Uh, we, uh, we distribute funds first with open calls, so there, are, there is equal opportunity for all. This might have some limitations, but at the end, the, the positive uh, side is uh, much better rather than the kind of arbitrarity uh, of directly supporting uh, someone. Uh, the second uh, thing is uh, that uh, we have proportional application procedures. We do not put everyone into the same basket because whenever we did that or when most donors do that, the big fish always eats the small fish. And we have these large organizations that are that are well established, that have very high capacities in drafting project proposals, and they always get the most of the funds. And uh, most of grassroots organizations that work in the community level are left uh, aside. So what we do, we, we separate them. We have limitations of, let's say, annual turnover or, uh, or other elements that make sure that uh, they are not competing with very well established uh, organizations. The third thing is that we have external decision making on, uh, on grants uh, decision. Although we manage the entire programs, we never take decisions on, uh, uh, on that. So we have uh, external uh, evaluators with high reputation and, and integrity uh, that uh, are actually drawn uh, for, each, for each of the, of the rounds. The fourth, I think the most important thing is that everything is public, starting from the uh, initial criteria uh, to the list of uh, evaluators. Are, their profiles are public uh, in, in our websites. The, uh, and the most important thing, I think, we, we, we conduct public interviews for, uh, for shortlisted applicants. Everyone, even in, let's say, in U.S., you can, you can watch them in Facebook through, through live streaming and uh, make sure what is being uh, uh, assessed and evaluated. And in the end, we continually support them. We pay for their audit, for example, uh, or for those, because uh, we support also individuals and unregistered organizations, we, uh, in, in small amounts, uh, we execute the payments. We don't even uh spend in transaction cost of requiring an individual which is an activist to to make sure that they have accounting rules and uh, uh and everything else on the participation side uh, very briefly uh, we do not uh, we do not have uh, thematic priorities because uh, the context is so dynamic we leave it open so to be able to respond to diverse needs of uh, uh, of the communities uh, and specific situation what is the uh, we have two uh, cross-cutting or horizontal conditions, which is constituency involvement in the in the interventions, uh, and the focus on marginalized groups, uh, rather than let's say thematic uh, priorities, be it environment, anti-corruption, whatever it may uh, it may be. Uh, uh, the okay. the third thing okay. is that we have diverse instruments, so to fit to different needs, uh, and it's a participatory process. As I was saying, from the design to the to the evaluation, we are even thinking of, let's say, participatory monitoring now uh, of not only us and donors, but also beneficiaries monitoring the projects that uh, that are funded. I think these uh, elements uh, can be applied in also in when we discuss about institutionalizing the uh, the diaspora contribution here. Can I give uh, one right. example here? Right. That is very good. Oh, sorry. Uh, one no, no. I was just I was just going to ask you. So, are these enough? What uh, Taulan just described as, as uh, tools to, to increase transparency and efficiency and also build trust. Uh, well, you have, you have to start somewhere. To me, it, it's more than a good start. And just to give one example, um, the Biberai Foundation in the United States gave something like 2 or $3 million to the Albanian American uh, Development Fund in Albania for scholarships to study in the United States. So this is an example of diaspora philanthropy giving to an institution that it believes will do the good work and in a transparent way. And also most importantly, because the institution in Albania has the capacity to do it, whereas the philanthropist in the United States does not. So we have to kind of mm -hmm. a marriage between these two kinds of groups, people that have the money and the people that have the capacity to implement the work. Yeah, and, that, and that's a good example because it's uh, it was also uh, a project that was brought forth with the administration part of it, which was uh, a, a international organization that does the filtering and processing of, of scholarships of that nature. 
the, the partnering aspects of this and actually everything Thailand said to me is what I call the minimum standard. Um, in addition to that, you then need to market your capabilities and why your organization versus a lot of other large NGOs that are trying to pull the money to other parts of the world. So, uh, um, you know, in some respects, uh, it's it's a never ending uh, competition for this opportunity set, but you're making Taolan's job impossible if all the case studies when, when a visiting group comes to diligence his organizations are frightening stories um, over a coffee someplace. So um, I think we need to also turn our temperature to the successes, and there are many. Um, and uh, I think uh, when I look around uh, uh, the region, uh, even in just in Kosovo, AUK gave birth to the charity organization. Charity yeah. organization gave birth to uh, Action for Mothers and Children. Action for Mothers and Children inspired uh, other organizations. I look at uh, Spresa, who unfortunately has had technical difficulties, but her case study yeah. of working with children with autism has spawned at least three organizations that I'm aware of all over the region that work with children with autism, who, many of whom either partnered with her or took her example in terms of putting it to work in various places. Um, there are countless scholarship funds now to enable young people to uh, to receive an education. There are now more and more companies every year in the region that are realizing that if they hope to have a future as a company, they better put some money to work to actually make sure they're training and developing the people they want to one day hire. And so they're starting to form public-private partnerships between themselves and the universities in the area. Uh, RIT Kosovo is... Uh, one of those organizations that's kind of leading that format in terms of how to do it in a way that's very effective. Uh, there are others that will undoubtedly follow, hopefully are inspired by the similar mm -hmm. example. Um, but in the end, um, we, we can easily point to lots of sorry stories, but uh, there's also a lot of really good examples. And if people want to do things right, uh, there are great case studies on how to do that. Uh, I do worry when I see the government, on the other hand, on the heels of uh, of the earthquake putting up a website saying donate here mm -hmm. not clear where here is not clear <laughs> you know who's responsible for that money or what's going to happen with it those case studies are the ones that draw your uh, your head scratching okay. and uh, it does make you wonder um you know how to, how to get past that but also donors have to be responsible if you put money in those kind of vehicles you kind of deserve what you get uh, you have to uh, trust in the diligence of the opportunity. And, and I, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I get, you know, maybe multiple times a day, the, the most beautifully written sob story um, about somebody who needs something. And uh, I will assure you that some meaningful percentages of those are frauds. And, uh, and the reality is we have created now a, a culture um, and, and somebody referred to it earlier as, you know, unrestricted love uh, that has been abused. And um, that unrestricted love is ending. And uh, if you look at remittance activity that is non-family based, that is shrinking. Um, and by the way, there's also some really good studies that have been done that say the remittance activity, even with the best of intentions, has handicapped families and loved ones back home who are now living at a base yep. good enough lifestyle that when job opportunities and opportunities to develop themselves and work hard towards something better, they're uninspired because they seem not worth it when you're doing okay. Um, and so we are we are in this strange place as a civil society in the region where we need to do kind of a self-evaluation and explore what is the role uh, of philanthropy mm. going forward and how do we inspire perhaps uh, a better way to do things and maybe better communication, role model opportunities, joint development opportunities. And last but not least, just going back to something uh, Talan said earlier, good governance usually is the byproduct of great leadership. And if the board is weak with incapable people and, uh, and with questionable backgrounds, rest assured that organization is not gonna be very good. Can I say something quickly sure. that relates to that? Uh, it's very important that non-governmental organizations and philanthropists don't view each other as competing. You know, I always say, don't think about competing for the same pie. We're all trying to increase the size of the pie together. And the more transparent and highly qualified all Albanian NGOs are, the more donations are gonna to flow to all of them because there'll be a greater trust overall. 
Yes, and I think mm -hmm. also um, the structure of the board and the organization uh, being made public. I think uh, Richard was just talking about, um, you know, the you know questionable board members. I think when NGOs are getting ready to, um, you know, set up their board of directors or an advisory board, uh, they really do research and they look into how they want to structure their organization, and uh, they want to make sure they publicize that as well as, um, you know, at least two people interviewing uh, board members, potential board members, and you have a due diligence process. I mean, almost like a background check on people that are joining your board. Um, I think it's very important. Um, you need trusted people. Um, you know, those are the public face of your NGO. And if you have respectable and, you know, trusted people in the community, you know, Albanian community is small. Um, if you do your due diligence and you put good people on your board, uh, you know, the transparency and accountability comes with those personalities as well. And you kind of adapt that culture uh, with the people that, you know, join your organization. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good. Very good suggestions. And and I'm sorry to have to, to kind of remind you that we're running out of time and that would be my responsibility not being able to to uh, manage time correctly it's uh, but let me just uh, i would like to hear from Shpresa because she, she just joined us now <laughs> are you here can you hear us i can hear you i don't know can you hear me i can't me? hear you dear we can, hear you. we can hear you, Shmessa. You can continue. Uh, actually, it'd be okay. for you to share your case study for, with us. Is, is it Taulan? Can you hear Shmessa, or is it just me? Uh, I, I, I think I, I heard. Yeah, I can hear her when she talks. <laughs> okay. Yes. Go, Shmessa. Yeah, I can hear now. Just to congratulate on everything you do, I am honored, and just to say, go on, guys. In all this. Uh, my experience of 10 years is it's, my board was based on the parents of the kids, meaning it's investment, is interest investment on their own, till fundraising, any donation, anything, it's why don't we look into two other things? Why my idea for Kosovo Albania, get the product, Put a sign, put the things, whatever you fundraise them for, whatever organization, any sugar, any water, any drink, donation 1% or any percentage for that to regenerate money out of the local pro products, which we never thought of it. Uh, do the grants, do the projects, involve all the embassies, involve all the uh, businesses, because every fundraising that I've done, I auctioned from the soap to the towel, to the shampoo, to the pair of shoes, and everyone is willing to give. Meaning we have a higher level to reach, but until we get there, we have to do anything and everything we can. So to me is, involve more people of everyday life. Is it a sport activity? Is it a concert? Is it a buying the tickets? Is it organizing any sports events that one percentage or one euro or five euros, whatever, to go to each of the uh, uh, NGOs that we have? Uh, with Mark, I have spoken to, to get it to another level, meaning in here or anywhere in the world, do one event and make a big change. Because each one of us have our own our NGOs that we do. So, but with purpose, meaning, okay, this year we take this NGO and we do huge step forward but that is not stopping us doing even the small part that we take in each one of our ngos i applaud all of you i am honored even though late and to say love you and let's go forward with i'm so sorry i, I... 
I heard nothing what you said. I'm sure there was something very interesting, but I. It was very inspiring. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I missed that part. Uh, I know she's inspiring. She was one of the winners of Fides in 2015. And I had tears when she went up there to receive her award for a great contribution to the uh, sector of. Uh, children with special needs she's contributed so much and it started from her own personal story and moved on and actually she's now been helping so many families in Alba in kosovo uh, that have children with special needs especially uh autism and i i i send you virtual hugs for all your great work you do uh, and you, now man. Uh, given that we're actually are running out of time, although the, the conversation yeah. is very interesting, uh, let me just move quickly to the final part of, of our discussion and then we can see if there's any question uh, from whoever is listening from the audience. Uh, diaspora and post-COVID new situations. Uh, we all know that the, this pandemic has shaken every aspect of our life. Uh, there's no more returning back to the lifestyle we've had before COVID-19. Uh, COVID so we need to find ways, especially for foundations and for organizations like the one I lead, which is a 20-year-old organization working, uh, a grassroots organization working with local communities. We need to also think of redefining our uh, way to work at communities with people to get them again and again inspired of protecting democracy protecting protecting human rights in, in kosovo because the way uh, the pandemic was managed it showed how politically uh, polarized the society is in kosovo but not only in kosovo we're treating COVID as a war therefore uh people are are frightened, but also kind of depressed from what's going on. So how can philanthropy redefine itself for the purpose of supporting uh, public good? How can us organizations redefine our, our, our missions to be closer to, to citizens and to try and see and get them inspired and also uh, mobilized to take responsibility for monitoring uh, governments and institutions and for demanding accountability and transparency from all of them, not only institutions, but from, from organizations as well, from each other as well. Who would like to share something about? Well, look, I think uh, if I could start us sure. off, I think the, the COVID crisis is really no different than many others that we've had. I mean, I, I, we had the refugee crisis post-communism in Albania, you had, uh, the wartime crisis, you had the parallel institutions, you had, uh, um, I mean, wave after wave after wave of, of macro uh, dynamics. Uh, the COVID crisis was a little bit um, disturbing because it's an invisible enemy. And, uh, you know, there were some artists and some business leaders and, uh, uh, and the like early on that got involved with the media to raise funds for basic uh, equipment for the uh, for the nurses and doctors that were trying to help people in Kosovo. They, I think Kosovo had two respirators, if I remember, at the beginning of this crisis. Uh, obviously, there have been donors who have made more available. Uh, Albania is really in not much better situation. There, there are many people who are really sick, including some, some uh, celebrities and, and great artists of our community that maybe aren't even publicly known at the moment. but. Uh, there are some people fighting for their lives that are, that are yes. national treasures to our to our society. Um, having said all of this, um, you know th these things that we've been talking about on this call um, are the things that build that partnership for these kinds of crises. Uh, it's not unusual um, uh, what you're seeing in the Balkans, where uh, business interests or poverty fear um, is is overwhelming the fear of an illness and uh, that is really what's at battle it's not as much as political as the politicians want to make it it's actually a legitimate concern you have uh, you have people whose business livelihood is in danger if uh, you comply with the things that support um, fighting back this particular type of virus um, you also have uh, the dynamic where 
the youth in many cases are unaffected by the illness and they in some cases view their role in life as uh, being less responsible for the elders in their community and uh, uh, as a result we've lost a little bit of that uh, generational respect and appreciation uh, for one another's risks uh, on a shared basis and uh, there are a lot of lessons that we could take out of this COVID crisis but uh, one of them that I hope we don't do is what's happened here in the U.S., which is uh, an entirely politicized dynamic, which, you know, I don't, I never heard in my lifetime before this uh, a virus that had a Republican or a Democratic uh, uh, party associated with it. And, uh, um, and for the first time, I think people are talking in illusions instead of in practical realities. And both are legitimate. I, I don't underestimate the, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the crisis and harm that's going to come from the poverty and from the loss, real loss of life and, 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 and treasured lives um, that are happening as a byproduct of, uh, of this particular virus. So there are really good lessons. I've, look, I've lost cousins, I've lost loved ones and dear friends even here in the US with uh, the best medical care available in the world. And, uh, I will say that uh, th these are not these are not trivial trivial topics uh, to be contending with. Thank you, Rich. No, I mentioned the political uh, polarization because uh, apparently this pandemic uh, somehow brought in surface the the fact that public institutions, the governmental institutions, have lost public support and trust, and therefore people are not taken into consideration any kind of uh, a suggestion by the government to follow certain rules or, or certain measures. And they're also tired of the situation, be it uh, the economic crisis, the health issues, et cetera. So this is why I mentioned the, the political polarization and, uh, and by no means I wanted to, to politicize the, the pandemic. It is a health issue strong health issue that but that has affected our lives in every single uh, dimension of it so thank you so any other thoughts on the the support i can public bring good? i can I can briefly bring one perspective which i think is important sure. at this moment uh COVID has exposed, hmm. COVID has exposed the inequality throughout the world and including in our societies uh, and uh, in in a in a country like Kosovo or Albania, these inequalities are only deepening uh, in a very quick uh, with a quick uh, tempo uh, during during COVID times. Uh, most of the population uh, lacks access to basic resources, uh, financial, but not only uh, financial. And uh, if we do not uh, systematically approach this. Uh, uh, this problem, I think, uh, it, it will only grow and it will uh, become uh, almost irreversible. Uh, why I mentioned this in this discussion of philanthropy, I think that uh, philanthropy, at least for some years, needs to, in a way, condition uh, this support with uh, involving people, giving uh, the marginalized groups a voice, not only working for them, but also working with them. Uh, whenever funds are uh, are provided, and I'm talking about uh, women, women, I'm I'm talking about youth, I'm talking about ad elderly, I'm talking about people with special needs. Uh, in terms of numbers, the marginalized uh, group uh, groups are the majority in our in our in our states. But in terms of access to resources, uh, they they are far uh, far behind. And I think philanthropy for some years need to have needs to have this very specific. Uh, sen uh, needs to be very sensitive to this uh, to this uh, inequality here. Uh, I just want to say quickly here that you know, in one way, COVID will help philanthropy because there'll be greater need, as Talant just said. Uh, it's easier. The world has gotten smaller with all the Zoom meetings and all of this. Uh, but the big monkey in the room or elephant in the room is that the economy is still very questionable for at least another year, and this is going to make it very difficult to ask for significant donations, not just in Albanian community, but, uh, you know, worldwide. All around, yeah. Uh, I mean, we noticed just last year with the uh, Global Albanians Foundation that, you know, we kind of wanted to be a organization that was going to help NGOs, uh, how to say, uh, teach them how to fish and not give them a fish. 
But in reality, this year, we were like an emergency relief uh, organization helping for earthquake and COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, so sort of reshifting to this uh, paradigm of sort of long-term philanthropy, teaching someone how to fish as opposed to just building a house, as Richard said, uh, this will take time. And I think it will be real difficult for the next year. Right. Yeah, and, and you are competing. I know that Mark said don't think about competing among charities, but uh, you I mean, our family foundation, for example, um, is just as active here in the U.S. as it is. Uh, our, our giving is about equal in both, both geographies. Um, and I can tell you that in the U.S., you have organizations that are in that same crisis management mode. I mean, I'm on the board of, a, you would argue, a very well-endowed institution uh, in our community here, and uh, um, they are they are struggling right now because they have uh, large facilities that uh, used to house and accommodate a lot of people from elderly down to youth, and uh, those facilities are empty. So. Uh, um, at the moment, there's financial strife across so many different organizations that are going to be calling on desperate need for funds. And, uh, mm-hmm. and the number of people who can actually offer them is, is smaller than ever because there's also been losses across many, many spheres as well. And let's not also forget that these governments have been uh, stimulating and spending dramatically, uh, especially here in the U.S. And all of that is going to come back around to... Uh, you know, tangible tax increases that are going to mm. and they need to refill those coffers. Uh, so, you know, the near term horizon is best practices are going to be more needed than ever for organizations to survive and thrive. Um, having said that, in the Balkans, there's so few that are doing it well that uh, there's room there's room for some really good organizations to uh, to grow into the space. I, I agree. Can I say just But also thing? at the end of the day, philanthropy itself or foundations cannot resolve everything that is happening. If there's no like strong institutions and strong democracy, uh, it will be difficult for us as well to to make any change for good in our in our own countries. That's just yeah, I'm gonna interrupt you only because Shreya wanted to wanted to add uh, I think she's had challenges on the on the call, but uh, um, you know, I think uh, uh, I'll, I'm going to segue to her, but I think more than ever, uh, the partnership between civic society and the institutions of the state are going to make a difference. And uh, in Kosovo in particular right now, you have a very fragile government with a yeah. lot of community and, um, Absolutely. And, and really not that different in Albania where you have uh, a, you know, half the representation of the population not showing up to, to pass laws. Even the most basic laws, uh, like my kids are waiting for their dual citizenship, and uh, um, you know they've been waiting for now a year and a half because we can't get a parliament that would approve a basic piece of legislation that would allow it to proceed. They can't get it under the old laws because it's about to be renewed, and the new laws are not being renewed for a year and a half. <laughs> well, the, yeah, that's Albania. That's Albania. But the the state, uh, the the law just passed. Uh, I heard from former colleagues of mine in Albania that the this, uh, the law about citizenship just passed, but there still are uh, bylaws that need to be written and approved, so. And a president, <laughs> and a president that needs to sign it. But, uh, I want to uh, express maybe have the last word. I just had to add that my therapists at the centers <laughs> are working to keep the kids busy without pay, trying to fundraise but in a positive note, Balkan Conference on Autism is supposed to be happening April 2nd to 4th. Because of the COVID, we are going to ha- have it Zooming, but we are not letting it go. Meaning, next week, we are making it happen in COVID, but still going on and still supporting and not giving up. And that's all what it's us, you know, Mother Teresa used to say, do the small thing with lots of love. <laughs> so we are in it all together. All said. Yep. And there. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, don't, I couldn't hear. <laughs> but <laughs> I think I'm going to have to have a special call and a private call with Pressa to, to discuss all about what we discussed together tonight because I couldn't hear any of her uh, and I feel so bad for it. You'll, you'll hear it uh, online when you, when you listen to the recording. <laughs> okay, great, great. Uh, well, uh, I don't have any more questions. It was really, really interesting and very inspiring to, to have this discussion with you. I don't know if there's any questions from the audience, if someone is, is listening to uh, this panel. Uh, I'll just wait for a few seconds to see if there's any questions. If not... No, they cannot speak. They can only write. They, yeah. Yeah. they cannot There's speak. They can... A question here okay. from, from Martin Russell that I, I thought was a worthwhile conversation topic because it was what we talked about at the beginning of the call. And, uh, you know, public-private partnerships uh, are going to become more important um, to the development of the Balkans. And uh, okay. uh, I think uh, it's, it's crucially important that the institutions of Kosovo and Albania and candidly the region get this right because uh, the way, or I should say the harm of getting it wrong is massive. Um, so imagine a scenario where internationals come in even with good intentions to work on projects that uh, uh, are ill-conceived, low on priority and uh, cost massive amounts of money. Um, this money, in many cases, either directly or indirectly, is going to tax the sovereign credit profile of the country. Uh, you know, translate that, if you will, to taxes on the people uh, or challenges to the government uh, because th that credit profile is limited. It's not an unlimited resource. So if these priorities aren't set well in partnership with the uh, the, the will of the people, or if you will, or the priorities of the country in a strategic way, you could see the squandering of the government's, or the country's, forget the government, the country's entire financial capacity uh, without the commensurate results, which leads to usually really bad things happening. Um, so mm -hmm. these, these public-private partnerships can be fantastic because they provide leverage and, and, and potency, but uh, mishandled, un, uh, you know, unprofessionally filtered, uh, and not understanding the implications of uh, of employing the sovereign uh, profile of the country uh, can be devastating and can last for a generation or more in terms of the harm it can cause. I mean, it, it, it's equivalent in some ways to the effects of the pyramid schemes back in Albania if it's yeah. not managed carefully. Yes, and we also go back to the will of people that has been compromised in Kosovo and Albania, for that matter, for many years. So uh, we end up with these governments that, uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah. This is this, the philanthropy call. Uh, <laughs> this is this is <laughs> <laughs> this is where <laughs> the discussion becomes. <laughs> Becomes, becomes a lot more uh, complicated because, like I said, we had a government, now we have another one that it's uh, pretty much is being called illegitimate government because of so many uh, complicated issues. Uh, in the middle of pandemic crisis, <laughs> we had a change of governments. But anyway, that's a discussion for another panel, most likely. I don't want to get into the uh, politics of philanthropy, Let's keep it to the transparency and accountability and the lovely engagement and contribution of diaspora to the countries of origin. Uh, I, I believe if you have no more to add, I think I would really like to thank you, all of you, for the very interesting uh, discussion, insights, uh, friendly and warm uh, thoughts that you shared with me tonight, but also with each other. It was lovely to see all of you virtually. Uh, I Again, I express uh, my sadness that I wasn't able to, to hear uh, Spressa. I'm sure she said something very inspiring. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for finding time to be part of this discussion and this very important panel. I'm, I'm honored again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank have you. a great weekend, have a great weekend. Greetings from Pristina, yeah. gloomy Pristina. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.
Greetings. Greetings. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao. Greetings. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Man.